So our next speaker is um, Sahra Karakoç. Uh, she is from Bilkent University. Uh, so we, uh, with Sahra, we uh, studied mainly probability theory. And today uh, she will um, talk about central limit theorem. Hi, thank you. Uh, I will talk about the central limit theorem today. And the talk will go like this. I will, I will first talk about the normal distribution because it's important for the central limit theorem. Then I will mention uh, what the central limit theorem tells us. I will talk about a bit of the history of the central limit theorem and try to give you some intuition as to why it works. And then I will outline the proof of the central limit theorem. Now, we start with the normal distribution. Um, normal distribution, we have a random variable. It's called normal if um, its mean is mu and variance is sig sigma squared, if it has such a uh, special um, density function. And if the variance of this uh, normal random variable is one and expectation is zero, we call it standard normal random variable. And it has even a more special form of density function. For those of you who don't know these concepts, I will briefly explain this random variable X is a function and it can take some values on the X axis, we see the possible values that it can take. And if you look at the red one, it's a standard normal distribution. And what the density function is this, uh, for a random variable to, between, be, to be between minus one and one, the probability of this event is the area under this red curve. So this is the connection. And the, you can think of the expectation of, uh, as an average, but uh, this average is weighted by the probability of the outcomes. And to understand the variance, if you look at the um, yellow line, for instance, yellow density function, its variance is big. It's the biggest one out of these. And it's just um, a bit more um, you know, loose than the other ones. It's not centered around the mean. And the blue one is centered around the mean, so it has a small variance. You can think of these concepts as so. It's enough for this presentation. So to um, appreciate the normal distribution of it, I will talk about the history of it. This is series, it's an asteroid, but when it was first, first observed in the beginning of the 19th century, people thought that it was a newly discovered planet. And so everyone got excited to observe it again after it went behind the sun. So people tried to calculate its orbit, but at this time there wasn't so much consensus on uh, how to measure things and how to approach the errors in measurements because you, you just measure a quantity, let's say you're measuring a stick of one meters, but you don't know the true quantity. And every time you measure it, you have some error. Sometimes you measure it at 101 centimeters, sometimes you measure it 95, whatever. So people didn't really agree on these things, but Gauss made some assumptions. Gauss was one of the people who were trying to uh, calculate the orbit of series. And he said that, okay, errors do not distribute uniformly. So they're not all errors, uh, have the same uh, probability of occurring. Although this sounds like it's something, you know, commonsensical, people didn't really agree on these uh, assumptions here, but Gauss made them all. He said that small errors are more, li more likely to occur than the large errors. And he said that for you to measure your one meter stick, uh, nine to five centimeters is as likely as for you to measure it 105 centimeters. So plus and minus errors uh, are equally likely. And he said that if you measure the quantity over and over again, and if you took the average of these values, it's probably it's your best bet, you know, of that um, value of your quantity, true value of your quantity. And after making these assumptions, he rigorously found a distribution function, which is exactly the distribution function of the normal random variable that we use today. So it's weird. What he found was that errors should distribute normally when you make these assumptions. And it's even weird, weirder to know that Gauss using these assumptions calculated, calculated the orbit of errors more correct than anyone else. So he was right making this. So there's something beautiful here. The errors somehow distribute normally, but there are some questions that we should ask here. Why does this happen? Okay, the answer is central limit theorem, and I will explain why. But other question is, does this happen because we are we are measuring things, you know, or does this happen just because of the series or because of the series, or do we see it somewhere else, you know? For the second question, we will make an experiment together. We will go to this website. Okay, moment, I couldn't here. Now on this website, we have a distribution function here. It's a uniform distribution function. It means that every outcome is equally likely. 
And what this website does is this. We can pick the sample number here, n. And if I pick two, it will get two random samplings out of this distribution and add them up, calculate their average, calculate their mean, and then plot the mean on the third graph. This is what this website does. And we can repeat this 10,000 times. And it looks like something, but not so beautiful. But if I increase this n to 20, let's say, and make it, we see a normal distribution. Now it's surprising, but maybe not so much because we use the uniform distribution. But what if I did something totally ugly, like something random that I just created here? Let's make it different so it doesn't look like uniform. And make number n2. OK, it probably it won't look so good because we make n2. But what if I increase this n again? What will happen? OK, we again see a normal distribution. And this is something so weird. You know, there is no reason why you get a weird distribution. And you sample from that distribution. As long as you sample enough, you make n20, let's say, and calculate the mean. These means distribute somehow normally. So again, another question, does this always happen? Apparently, it's not something about series or measuring errors. But does this always happen? Now, the answer is in the central limit theorem. It says that if you have a finite expectation and finite variance, the answer is yes. However weird your original distribution is, you are going to see a normal distribution when you sample out, sample from that distribution, calculate the mean. Those means somehow will distribute normally. And I will explain this statement in detail right now. You know, here IID means independent, identically distributed. These XJs are the samples that we were taking from the uh, distribution in the simulation. And the number N here, SN, how many of them? I made it two, I made it 20, that's the number. And you know the expectation and variance and the independence comes from the fact that one sample doesn't affect the other one. And identical means we took them all from the same distribution. If you remember, I didn't change the distribution. So their distribution were identical. Now, here we just add them together and then calculate uh, and standardize it. We, the reason we do this is because we want to see a convergence is if we don't subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, which is a square root of variance, um, this thing might not converge. So we wanna see a convergence. And this is something that we can always do because we assumed finite variance and mean therefore. So this thing converges to normal distribution somehow. I will give an intuition, but before that, let's talk about the history of central limit theorem a bit. You know, people didn't only uh, work on the, on such concepts to calculate, like you know, make measurements and calculate errors and find the true po true value of a quantity, but they also were interested in such things because of gambling. You know, as always, it happens in probability. And one simple game can be represented with a Bernoulli random variable. Let's say that. This is a game where there exists two outcomes only. You might get with probability P here, this is the uh, probability mass function of this game. You might get $1 or with probability one minus P, you might get $0. This is a simple game. Okay. If you add these games, if you add these binary random variables, meaning you play this game again and again, and many times, you find a binomial random variable. You can represent this game by a binomial random variable. And people first tried to somehow approximate this binomial random variable with a normal distribution. And the reason behind this is apparent because in the central limit theorem, if you remember, we were adding identical random variables. So it's somehow you know, intuitive. And if you look at the um, probability mass function of the binomial, it already looks like the you know, discrete form of the normal random variable. So it was you know, somehow intuitive. But um, people couldn't do it, the more the more didn't uh, do it because the method he was using was so cumbersome. Laplace did it later. Uh, and um, this was the first thing proved that central limit theorem applies to, but this is something so uh, specific. So we cannot really generalize from that. And people worked and worked on such things and Laplace gave his 40 years working on the central limit theorem and uh, subjects alike. And he said that quantities in large numbers, meaning that adding the same random variable to itself again and again, or repeating the same process again and again, is the most delicate, the most difficult, and the most useful part of the whole probability theory. And other mathematicians worked on such concepts too, you know, so famous and um, successful mathematicians. And the thing is, the thing I want to mention here is that the modern rigorous probability theory 
uh, is not so old. It's, it's you know, rigorously defined in 1930s by Kolmogorov. But these theorems with the law of large numbers, something similar to central limit theorem, they were older than the uh, modern probability theory. In some sense, they defined uh, the modern probability theory. They are not the um, consequence of the modern probability theory. So they are so important. This is why uh, the name of central limit theorem, the central, makes uh, a lot more sense. It's important. One person who worked on such concepts was Galton. This is what's called Galton board. Uh, what happens here is that you just leave leave these little balls and they go from this uh, gap. And these things are called pegs. You can imagine them as dots. And whenever a ball comes here, it can go to right or left with equal probability. This is designed as so. And uh, every ball will follow a path and just fall into a segment. This is what happens in this board. And this is actually a binomial uh, random variable. How so? Every line here is a Bernoulli random variable. You have two outcomes, right or left. And when you add them, I don't know, 10 or 11 times, it's a Bernoulli random variable. And why Galton invented such a thing, such a toy, is that um, he wanted to illustrate that binomial random variable can be approximated by normal. As you can see, you leave these dots and they just distribute normally. And this wasn't the only thing Galton did. He was work, working uh, on some genetic, like hereditary work, and he was trying to understand how some genetical characteristics were inherited from one generation to the other. And he was he were seeing a lot of data, and he has realized that human height distributed normally, you know. And he was, you know, am, amazed by this fact. He said, "Why? Why does this happen?" With the same curiosity, probably that Gauss asked, "Why?" Gauss asked, you know, why do errors distribute normally? You know, we have seen the central limit theorem. We actually have the answer here, SN, you know, but um, it's not so easy to see. I, I will explain. Human height, actually, it's it's what people call, you know, uh, what, do, what do they say? Usually they attribute it to, to this word to Nietzsche, this quote to Nietzsche. They say, out of chaos, there comes order, something like that. You know, these things, human height or the errors you would make while making a measurement are so random that they, they somehow end up orderly. Here, while measuring something, there are so many things that could go wrong. You might be looking from the wrong, wrong angle or your hands might be shaking or I don't know, the lighting wasn't perfect. And error itself acts like a sign here. It's a random variable. It's an error random variable, which is some of so much little other atomic error random variables. And human uh, same is the same in, in this sense. It's just consequence of a lot of features that are so random and might be viewed as independent in some sense. And when you add these things, you get one person's height. So they obey the central limit theorem because they are so random. And we observe that they are indeed distributed normally. Now I will try to give, still, we don't know why this theorem works intuitively. We just know that, okay, things distribute normally, and this is what central limit theorem tells us. But I will try to give some intuition as to why this happens now. Um, and we are going to do this by examining this rolling die case. Um, let's just um, think that our random variable assigns some numbers uh, to the outcomes. And let's say you roll three and our random variables assign a three. Here, the probability mass function of this random variable will be a uniform, you know, equally likely every outcome, uniform uh, mass function, and it's just one over six. It's um, here when, it, when things are discrete, uh, the probabilities are the heights of the sticks. Uh, every outcome is equally likely, and this is the probability mass function of our random variable. Beautiful. But what happens if we want to add these random variables to itself? Because this is what we have been doing in the central limit theorem. Okay, adding these two random variables for this specific case means, for example, rolling the same dice twice. And when we do this, when we add the first round and the second round, normally, theoretically, to be able to find the probability mass function of this sum of random variables, we should convolute their mass function. But um, we don't really need to care about that if you don't know convolution of, if you don't understand how, this, how it relates to this case, you can just understand it from this graph. For you to get a two out of this game of rolling two dice, you should get a one and a one again. 
for you to get a 12, you should get a six and a six again. There is only one way. But for you to get a seven, there are six ways. You can get a one and a six and six and one and three and four and four, three and so on. So whatever that is closer to the mean, there are so much more ways for that thing to happen. And the radical outcomes, when you convolute the probability mass function or when you add the same random variable to itself over and over again, they just become less and less likely. When you hit the number 32, that's rolling dice game. You know, when you roll the same dice 32 times, becomes fairly simple to a normal distribution, as you can see here. And you might say that maybe this happened because you used the beautiful uniform distribution. Well, this is a counterexample here. And this just shows that it happens almost always when you assume finite mean and variance, as in the central limit theorem. Here, I took this from a beautiful article. You can go and read it. What happens here, this is the original probability distribution, that's the function. And when you convolute this thing with itself 16 times, you just see a normal distribution, almost a normal distribution. Maybe you should repeat it more, you know, n goes to infinity in our central limit theorem anyway. But you still observe a normal distribution. So I hope this gives some intuition as to why things go to normal, because the radical outcomes are just becoming less and less likely when you convolute the mass function or density function. Now here, to talk about the proof of the central limit theorem, we should define some, uh, some ideas, some rigorous math we're going to do now. Here, um, a characteristic function def is defined as the expectation of this function here, e to the power i u x. And we know that if we calculate the characteristic function of the standard normal random variable, we find this e to the power minus u squared over two, and we're going to use this fact. We need the characteristic function. And side note, this is actually the uh, Fourier transform of the probability measure of x, if you know Fourier transforms. I will mention it in a bit again. Now here, the proof of central limit theorem will use the idea here. It will say that if the characteristic function of y ns will approach, is approaching to the characteristic function of y, which is a normal distribution, then we know that y ns will distribute to y, which is normal, in distribution. Will converge, yeah, I said it correctly. This is the idea. And uh, the idea is proven by the Lewis continuity theorem. If you look at the second part only, we don't need the part A. It says that we have a sequence of random variables, and they all have phi n uh, characteristic functions or Fourier transforms. Here, if these characteristic functions converge to a function of u, this is f. And if this f is continuous as zero, we know that there exists a characteristic, there exists a random variable with characteristic function f such that this extends conversion distribution x. And we can see it from this little figure better. If these are the characteristic functions of x sends, if they converge to a function, we know that this function is continuous at zero, then there exists a random variable x such that x sends converge to this random variable x. Beautiful. Here, we calculate the characteristic function of y ends. And I mentioned the Fourier transforms before. The um, Fourier transforms beautifully hidden when we get, go from this step to this step. As you can see, we have a sum here, and then it turns into a product. How this happens is this. The Fourier transform of sum of, no, the Fourier transform, of, OK, we know that the sum of random variables distribution will be the convolution of this function. And under Fourier transform, convolution will turn into a product. So convolution, free transform of convolution of two functions is the functions, is the product of these uh, free transforms of these functions. So here we are looking at uh, identical random variables and trying to find the sum of the characteristic function of their sum. And then it turns into a product. I just wanted to mention this little beautiful piece here. And then we do some manipulation use some mathematics. And we find that when we take the limit of y and the characteristic functions of y, and we approach to the characteristic function of the uh, standard normal distribution. And this tells us, as I just mentioned by Levy's continuity theorem, that y ends converge in distribution to the standard normal random variable. And that's all. These are the reference. But this is, this is not the full list. I will include the full list before we put the slides on the DRP page. And I want to thank you all. And I want to spe especially thank to my sweet mentor, Shevika Kuzga, for all the feedback and beautiful discussions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the great talk.